Welcome to El Salvador, Central America in 2019. To entrench political parties, worn out by repeated corruption scandals, wearily cycle each other once again. The population looks on. A fifth live in poverty, many under the control of two rapacious street gangs that have captured entire neighbourhoods. Less than 30 years from a civil war which left the country in ruins, the potential of its young democracy already seems to be petering out. Then, a leather jacket wearing, baseball cap sporting man steps onto the scene, a social media savvy saviour. Naib Bukele claims to be an outsider, although he's already been mayor of the capital, San Salvador. He takes the election by storm, winning in a landslide. He calls his party new ideas, and he has a lot of them. An anti-corruption commission, infrastructure projects, a new security plan. And one more that captures the eyes of the world, Bitcoin. Now President Bukele, he goes where no other country has gone before, making it El Salvador's national currency, along with the dollar. People can buy, sell and send remittances home, all with the government's new app. He says it's a sign of a country heading towards the first world. But there are darker ripples beneath the surface in El Salvador. Accusations of intolerance, corruption, financial instability. And then this. An unprecedented crackdown against the gangs, prompted by a spike in violence, beginning on the 27th of March. More than 17,000 people have been detained and counting. The Salvadoran parliament has approved a state of exception. That means the constitutional rights of those arrested, including the presumption of innocence, has been suspended. Four out of five Salvadorans, many suffering under gang control for decades, approve of the measure. Human rights groups feel the opposite. Many say the innocent are also being thrown into prison, their rights trampled on. But this isn't the beginning of worries over what critics say are the president's autocratic tendencies. When we headed to El Salvador in late January, long before the crackdown, watchdogs and opponents said that he was already pushing at the limits of democracy. It was our chance to speak to those for and against the president in a polarized country. In the first two years of his administration, Bukele had already marched soldiers into Congress. His supporters had ousted opposition-linked judges from the Constitutional Court and the Attorney General's office. The president had a firm grip on all of the organs of governance, his critics said, and didn't tolerate dissent, regularly attacking journalists, especially those from online outlet El Faro. In September 2020, it released a bombshell investigation that undercut Bukele's claim it was his iron fist strategy that had knocked down homicides. The government had actually done a secret deal with gang leaders, El Faro alleged, giving them benefits in exchange for less murders and electoral support. El Faro said that the report was based on copies of hundreds of prison reports, confirming dozens of secret meetings between officials and gang leaders. The president denied it all. Then in the same month, announced the outlet was under investigation for money laundering. The next year, one of its editors was denied a work visa and expelled from the country. And then, this January, Citizen Lab of the University of Toronto said that equipment belonging to 22 members of the El Faro team had been infected by Pegasus spyware. Pegasus, software developed by an Israeli cyber arms company and sold only to governments. Julia Gavarete was the first to discover she'd been bugged. Well, I was driving and I remember that I got the first email and by that moment we, we were confirmed that Pegasus was targeting most of the El Faro journalist. So these are the phones that have been spied on then? Yeah, probably someone is listening to us right now, we don't know it. 
I mean, that's very something very personal, isn't it? Like all of your stuff is in here, you know, like it's my, my life. It's my whole life. I mean, everywhere I, uh, everywhere I, I, I am, uh, the places that I, I go or or visit, Pegasus has that that access to. What can they pull out of this phone? What can they pull out of it during an attack? Everything. Uh, since the moment that they do an infection. When they are into your phone, they can see they can see, for example, what the message that you are typing, or they can get access to your contacts, to your uh, images, your videos. And it's like yeah. unlock to having an unlock cell phone in your hand. Who do you think was behind the spying on your phone? Well, we see is like a very strong nexus as citizen lab and access now told us like uh we cannot just think about these infections without thinking about Nayib Bukele's government or the interest that can have the, the government of Bukele he's not putting journalists in, in jail or he's not closing uh media outlets or whatever but we can see that there is a systematic persecution against journalists. And why do you think that there might be this special interest in spying on your newspaper? I think because of our work. For example, on September 2020, that was one of the months with the highest levels of infections. There was a moment when El Faro published this article about the negotiation between Bukele and the gangs. Then basically, what you're saying is whenever you touch things that are very sensitive for the government, maybe go across their interests, yes. or, or a lot of times you've seen then a, a peak in the, the amount of spying activity on yes. the phones. Yes, that's okay. the thing. And, and also, as I told you, that some specific day, if El Faro publish like a huge um, article or investigation that, you know, that it's a bomb, one of the cell phones was infected. At least one, one cell phone was infected. What, what's the government said when you've asked them about it? This official position uh, that they made, they denied that they had contracts with NLSO Group and they said like also that we don't have enough money to buy that, 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 that kind of software. But the money came from somewhere and it wasn't just used to bug the El Faro journalists. Other media outlets and civil rights figures also have mobile phones and other devices infected, says Citizen Lab, 35 in total. Their number included lawyer Jose Marinero, the president of an NGO focused on transparency. The spying disturbed him, but something else has even more. At one of El Salvador's most famous murals, he explained to us. So this is a monument to the revolution, to the 1948 revolution. Um, which put an end to a president's term that wanted to stay longer in power, to cling to power longer than what the term mandated at the time. Um, and I think it's, it's very significant in terms of a, a symbol of how El Salvador has a long history of uh, presidents and heads of state trying to cling to power longer than what they were meant for. The Constitution is very clear. There are five articles in the, in the Constitution that expressly prohibit re-election, presidential re-election. There's one that specifically says that a president cannot stay longer than one day after his term is over, right? This is very clear. And, and yet, the Constitutional Chamber interpreted the Constitution saying that only for this time, only with this one time, um, Bukele can actually run for re-election in 2024. So what's the actual danger with re-election then? Because, you know, we look at other countries, a lot of countries have re-election. It's a chance for the government to, to finish a political project, for there to be more stability. Why is that such a worry to you in, here in El Salvador? In a system that has very few functioning checks and balances, I think it's very easy for a president that gets re-elected the, to not only cling indefinitely into, in power, or to power, but also to abuse this power. 
But even before President Bukele declared his state of exception this March, Marinero claimed that the president was already abusing his power. The breaking point was February 9th, 2020. That is when Bukele storms the legislature with the army and the police, um, trying to pressure to, to coerce the legislature to approve a, a loan he was asking for his um, citizen security plan. So, so this, is, this is something that hadn't happened in a long time in Salvadoran history, right? He, he storms the, the legislature, he sits in the chair of the president of the National Assembly, and he starts the session of the National Assembly. I, I think this was a turning point, and like, this was also a, a, the moment when the international community recognized that there was a problem going on with democracy in El Salvador. Uh, a few months after getting into power, the Bukele administration started terminating a, an international accord agreement they had for an international anti-corruption commission in El Salvador, capturing the, the Access to Information Institute, which is the institution that guarantees citizens to access to public information, protecting um, officials, high-level officials, ministers included, th they all have been uh, pointed by um, uh, investigations of the American government as being involved in uh, high-level corruption cases. There's also mounting evidence how during the pandemic millions of dollars were misused. Why then does so many people still support President Bukele and his administration. I think a lot of Salvadorans seeing this interview wouldn't be believing you. Right. They'd be believing the government. Why is that? He 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 took food, he he handed out cash, three hundred dollars bonus for, for people who were um, struggling during the pandemic. And a lot of these people had never received anything from the government. Not even running water or education or security, they had never seen a police officer in, in their community. And what people are, are saying in different polls is that as long as government is solving their, their problems, are fa is facing the challenges that they face day to day, it's okay if it's not democratic. We went to San Luis Three, a working class community in San Salvador, to ask them about that and the president. This is the other side of El Salvador, those who support Bukele, and they are by far the majority. Near the entrance to the community, Carla's patting out tortillas and waiting for us. As we chat, her sons play on a couple of the laptops that the government gave to many poor youngsters so that they could study in the pandemic. ¿Y qué fue la reacción de usted cuando llegó los tres computadores? Ay, alegría. Alegría porque es una ayuda bastante para nosotros. Recibían como también despensas, porque yo sé que estaban dando despensas como comida, como cosas así. A gente también. En ah, la, la caja alimenticia. Así lo llamaban, la Ajá. caja uh -huh. okay. Sí. sí, sí, y la bolsa alimenticia, sí, gracias a Dios, este, fueron bien organizados y varias veces estuvieron viniendo aquí a la colonia, una parte por el gobierno y la otra parte por la alcaldía. Por lo menos no comprábamos, por lo menos lo que nos ayudó fue en los, en los frijoles, en azúcar, cosas bien necesarias de la sí. casa. Entonces sí nos ayudó bastante las cajitas. ¿Qué piensa usted entonces del, del presidente y su administración? Ha sido una administración más, más segura, más sincera para las personas, más colaboradora para, más que todo más para el pueblo. En otras administraciones, solo si era campaña de para ellos mismos, si acordaban de la colonia y de las personas. Y de lo contrario ya no mirábamos ayuda. Eso es lo que lo hemos destacado nosotros, que él por lo menos anduvo en la campaña, pero no se olvidó del pobre. Remember, this was before President Bukele's state of exception and mass detentions of alleged gang members. 
but almost 80% of Salvadorans have approved of that too. Otra de los temas grandes en El Salvador ha sido la seguridad, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo han sido las cosas en la, en, en la, en la comunidad aquí con referencia a la, a la seguridad bajo esta administración? Antes en la colonia, entrar a la colonia era para casi para la mayoría de gente la destacaban por, por, este, por peligrosa. Incluso hasta en las noticias nos salían por la colonia más peligrosa. Uh -huh. Porque era muy violenta, porque a veces a pleno día se daban las, los, las cosas con ellos y ahora nada de eso. ¿Ha salido algo de evidencia de que el gobierno ha puesto como una tregua con los diferentes grupos, con los diferentes pandillas? Escucho, escucho de eso cuando salió esta investigación. ¿Y qué, qué piensa de lo mismo? A referente a eso. Casi se nota que fue como un alto montaje de cámara de lo que supuestamente él estaba haciendo con las pandillas. Okay. Pero que realmente era Bukele, no lo era. Porque lo, lo que dijeron es no que era él, sino gente que trabajaba con su gobierno, Ajá. sus ministros, sí. ¿no? que fueran al, a las negociaciones. Pero usted no cree que, que fue real. No, no, okay. no, no. Carla, like many Salvadorans, believes that critical reports on the president and his allies are lies. He's stuck by them and they plan to stick by him. Even, and perhaps because of the mass arrests, despite reports citing evidence that authorities have not just rounded up gang members, but also people who simply live or work in neighborhoods dominated by crime. As part of the crackdown, Bukele's politicians and majority in Congress also reduce the age of criminal responsibility to 12. Voy a aprovechar la oportunidad para enviarle un mensaje a los criminales. Por ahí andan rumores que quieren empezarse a vengar de la gente honrada al azar. Hagan eso y no va a haber un tiempo de comida en las cárceles. Les juro por Dios que no comen un arroz. Y vamos a ver cuánto tiempo duran. Y no me importa lo que digan los organismos internacionales, que vengan a proteger a nuestra gente. Que vengan a llevarse a sus pandilleros. Si tanto los quieren, se los entregamos todo. Bukele's allies also introduced prison sentences of 10 to 15 years for journalists or anyone who broadcast content about the gangs that could cause, according to the government, anxiety or panic among the people. President Bukele himself smeared journalists on Twitter, calling El Faro's editor a piece of rubbish. But the president's critics do not just come from the press and human rights spheres. Leonor Selva, an economist and the executive director of El Salvador's National Association of Private Businesses, told us how she believes a man who's described himself again on Twitter as El Salvador's CEO is affecting the business community. You don't really know what motivates decisions being taken at government institutions because there are no long-term plans. There are no, you know, there's not an economic plan, there's not a fiscal plan put in place. But at the same time, you know, decisions now don't have to be justified. You know, often you don't get motivations when you get, you know, a, a, a resolution or an administrative decision. Um, you don't really know who's taking on decisions. There's, um, there's this kind of parallel structure of power where, you know, so congressmen really don't have decision-making power in making laws, which is kind of absurd. But then ministers don't have decision-making power within their ministries. And there's parallel advisors that have more power. And then there's the relatives of the president who, have, who don't have government positions who have more power. So you're subjected to a level of uncertainty that really, it makes operating in the country and living in the country kind of unlivable. And you want certainty. That's what we all want. And that's the same thing with investors. An investor who's you know, kind of picking which country in Central America, for instance, uh, to invest in, he's kind of placing his, he's going to place his bet and his investment on whatever gives him more certainty. Meanwhile, the country's debt payments are looming. Last year, the president came up with another idea to meet the funding gap. He announced it at a firework-fueled party, volcano bonds. It works like this. 
the government will sell a billion dollars worth of its debt to investors. Half of the money that brings in will be used to buy up bitcoins. When and if their value goes up, it'll help slash the debt. That alone is a gamble. The other half of that billion will be used for the president's other big idea. Bitcoin City, a completely new metropolis shaped like the symbol of the cryptocurrency itself in the southeast of the country. An economic free zone with all the trimmings. What is Bitcoin City going to include? Well, it's going to be right there in the Fonseca Gulf. And it's going to include everything. But we'll have zero income tax. Zero percent forever. This is a fully, fully ecological city that's work, that works and it's energized by a volcano. Yes, run with geothermal electricity from the nearby volcano, which will also be used to mine more bitcoins. It's a cryptocurrency investor's fantasy, if it's ever built. Why, why is that? Why are there doubts about well, it? Well, among other things, because there is no study at this point that the Conchagua volcano, which is the, vo the volcano that the government has claimed will be the one they'll be using for mining, actually it allows for that kind of geothermal exploitation. And I don't think those are investments that are done quickly. It's not the mining part. You already have that computer that has to do more with, you know, a software. But geothermal exploitation is a whole different thing. And then the other considerations, I think, are what we're seeing around the world. Um, there are other decisions where El Salvador has no weight on and has no incidence and, or relevance or impact in the global market. And those decisions are affecting Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. You know, there's, um, there's the US and China coming out with a digital coin. Uh, there are a lot of bigger players taking bigger decisions around cryptocurrencies and how the future of cryptocurrency actually looks like. Leonor's association and President Bukele are at loggerheads. He says it wants to sabotage his government's work. But even Bitcoin enthusiasts I talked to seem skeptical over the planned city. And the rollout of the so-called volcano bonds was delayed this March. I wanted to put all of those questions to the president himself in our trip this January. Not just finance, but democracy, transparency. There was plenty to talk about, but it wasn't to be. Of course, there's an absence in this program, the president, but that's not through want of trying. I reached out to multiple members of his comms team to ask for an interview with him or any other member of his administration, but I was told that nobody could do it. Paul. Paul Steiner is not a part of President Bukele's government and doesn't speak for it, but he's a strong ally and has a state post as head of the National Commission for Small and Micro Businesses. He also spoke to us during our January trip. There's been a lot of talk about Bitcoin City, that it's not realistic, uh, that when he unveiled it, some of the slides that he's shown were taken from another presentation and that this, there hasn't been a, a lot of actual thought put into how this will work. What's your response to that? It's easy to say, ah, Bitcoin City doesn't make sense. Why are you going to do that? But it's a trade zone. And, and the whole idea is to create trade. I think that what the president is doing is creating the opportunity. And I hear some people say, oh, but you don't have enough volcanoes, active volcanoes to do it. We've been running our geothermal energy off of extinct volcanoes for years. You don't need an, a, a volcano to be active in order to benefit from the, from the magma that flows beneath the soil. So I think what we need to do is, is maybe not react negatively to uh, news like this, especially when it's breaking a paradigm because nobody else is doing it. And so we have the first country with legal tender for Bitcoin, the first country creating a Bitcoin city, the first country who's now going to start using Bitcoin as a means of funding itself, What's wrong with that? The only thing is that in Central America, there's been quite a lot of planned cities uh, that have been announced and then haven't happened in the end, no? And so you'd think there'd be some sort of plans at least to check, hey, is this feasible? Do you know what I mean? This is our blueprint for doing it. But that's what's being done right now. 
But we don't have it yet. The announcement's made without that feasibility. The announcement was made because the conceptual feasibility was done. Okay. And the president got to a point where he said, yes, it's capable of being approved as part of my vision. Now, what we need to do is get the laws in place, get the plans in place, and start getting the investors in line so that we can make it happen. So, a plan in progress, one of many for this government. But will those plans pan out, or will the country default on its debt? Will the gangs be driven out, or will El Salvador sink into complete opacity and authoritarianism? In a country so polarized, it's hard to get objective answers. But one thing is for certain. President Nayib Bukele, so far, retains his popularity, even as his critics say he's moving past the limits of human rights and democracy.